Hey, everyone. Have you seen the latest Netflix documentary called How to Change Your Mind? It's a documentary that sheds light on the ever-emerging psychedelic industry. Well, in our latest podcast, we actually sit down with one of the doctors who's actually featured in this film, Dr. Ben Sessa. He's the co-founder of Awaken Life Sciences, where he talks in depth about the efficacies of MDMA and why it's the leading compound to be legalized, perhaps within the next 12 months. Why? He shares his thoughts right now in our latest podcast. What's going on, bro? Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Dales Report podcast. I'm your host, Shad Dales. Before we get into today's actual episode, feel free to leave a comment below because we're going to be talking about MDMA. It's a little bit different than most traditional compounds. Why? It's a molecule, and we're going to get into details as to why it's different. So it's rumored to be the first compound amongst all psychedelic compounds that will be legalized. Do you agree with that? As I said, leave a comment below, click on that bell for all notifications, and if you like what we produce, subscribe to our channel. Okay, let's get into today's podcast. We're welcoming in the co-founder and head of psychedelic medicine at Awaken Life Sciences, Dr. Ben Sessa. Dr. Sessa, great to have you on. How are things across the pond? Great to be here, Shad. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's a great pleasure to be doing this with you. Yep, you as things well. Are, things Sorry, over here ahead. in the UK are great. Um, we're having a lovely summer. Uh, we're enjoying good times here at Awaken Life Sciences. Our business is thriving. And um, yeah. it's a fantastic pleasure to be part of this psychedelic renaissance, which is going on. No kidding. Uh, glad to see you survive that heat wave. I know you guys got some really uh, hot weather earlier this summer, which is great. I'm sure most people from England love that sort of thing. But uh, how hot was it? Oh, it got up to over 40 in parts of the country, Ooh. which for the UK is uh, record breaking. It's a nice warm day today. I mean, obviously, we all know this is... Uh, part of a bigger picture of climate change, which is a very worrying situation. I know, situation. I know. But in the meantime, we're certainly enjoying some nice weather. Yeah, well, when I have you on, a lot of people are going to recognize your face. For those that have watched this new Netflix documentary called How to Change Your Mind, uh, I've been watching it. I actually just finished Chapter 3 last night, which basically highlights MDMA. The first one is about LSD. Part 2 is about uh, psilocybin. And Part 3, MDMA. Uh, I thought this chapter was incredible, really defining and educating viewers and how this molecule works. So first question, what did you think of the film? And um, how did you, I guess, arrange to be part of something so big? Because this is trending top five worldwide on Netflix right now. Yeah, I mean, that's just fantastic. You know, what did I think of the film? Well, firstly, I really liked Michael's book, which is yeah. based on Michael Pollan. And, you know, Michael Pollan is a is a big well-known broadcaster, writer, and, uh, and a TV star in America, I gather. He's less well-known here in the UK, but okay. the point is that to have someone who's so mainstream um, featuring this, this, this topic is fantastic because, yeah. you know, for too long, psychedelics have languished in the background um, in as, as considered a sort of weird fringe subject, but they're really not anymore. Um, this isn't a fringe subject. This is cutting edge neuroscience. This is cutting edge clinical psychiatry. Um, and so quite rightly, they're getting this mainstream attraction. I think Netflix did a really good job. I think they covered it really well. I mean, there's always going to be people who say, why wasn't this person in it? Why wasn't that person yeah. in it? Why wasn't this explored? But actually, I think over the course of the four, for the four episodes, I think it's a really good broad look at um, the current climate and the history of psychedelics. And it can only be good for the whole movement because it's about increasing accessibility of knowledge. And I thought Netflix did a really good job. It's all about the data, right? It's all about the data. Yeah, you asked me, how did I come to be in it? Well, I've been in the field for 15 to 20 years working with of psychedelics. You're right. um, I, I have, I've worked with, um, uh, I've either administered or received as a healthy subject in legal settings, MDMA, psilocybin, DMT, ketamine, and LSD. Um, been involved in the work at Imperial College London under Professor David Nutt um, for the last 15 plus years. Um, and uh, I, I knew the producer, Lucy Walker, who put the, together this film. And so she, she naturally got in touch and we, we filmed those interviews. So great, great to be part of that. Well, in the film, you mentioned how if you go in for surgery with an orthopedic doctor for a broken ankle, they mend the ankle, you're discharged from the service, and you're pretty much done for life because the treatment worked. 
Uh, and then you later said, why can't pharmacology be like that in psychiatry? So why hasn't it been like that in the past? Yeah, great question. What, what psychiatry has done, and this is not a conspiracy theory, it's not an intentional um, direction on the part of some evil pharma industry. It's quite yeah. simply apathy. What we've done for the last 40 or 50 years in psychiatry is we've painted ourselves into a corner in which we have favoured this top-down biological approach. Okay. And the pharma industry has been producing these daily maintenance medications, SSRIs and others, that you have to take every day, day in, day out, for weeks, months, decades, to mask the symptoms. But they don't cure the patient. Right. So that's, that's a very different model of how to do psychiatry. Keep taking the pills, hold back the symptoms. Um, and the analogy that I was making with surgery, if you have a broken leg, a fractured femur, you don't just hobble around on this broken leg taking painkillers for the rest of your life. Right. You go into surgery, which is an intensive, admittedly expensive, upfront treatment, mend that broken leg, and then you're discharged with a bit of physio for recovery. Now, psychedelics are much more analogous to that than the current model. Mm -hmm. um, it's intensive, upfront treatment that gets you better rather than just papering over the cracks for the rest of your life. So it's really a whole new paradigm for the way we could be doing psychiatry. Yeah. Um, I guess the big question, and, and this is one of the parts that I noticed with Michael talking about, how does this become, and I know it's a very sensitive subject because um, truthfully, people are, are very sensitive when it comes to mental health and these medicines combined with the business side. So when you look at the business side, the, the big pharma, it's not working. People are taking prescriptions every single day. You go in for less treatment, obviously, with whatever compound that could be benefiting you, and you only have to go once or twice. Um, how do you see this playing out as far as being a sustained uh, business model uh, long term for the industry? Well, you know, I think this we have to be careful here, again, about falling into the kind of conspiracy theory idea that somehow mental health services or the pharma industry want to maintain people as sick. Of course they don't. That's absurd. Um, okay. There are more than enough customers out there to keep us busy for the rest of our lives. Okay. Of course, as clinicians, we want to see people get better and get out. <clears throat> There's nothing we want more than that. And there are plenty of people behind them coming in. So the idea that, you know, we want to maintain and sustain mental illness in order to keep keep our jobs does not make sense at all. So I think that the, the, the psychiatric profession will wholeheartedly embrace the idea of treatments that get people better. Because, as I said, there's no shortage of people with mental health okay. problems. Um, and, you know, that means it just means a different way of doing it. But we'll still always have psychiatrists and doctors in the field and we'll always need treatment centers, but just delivering different sorts of treatments. Throughout your career, where are we today in 2022? A lot of conversations that have, I've had, many doctors have said I've never experienced anything like this before when it comes to mental health. Uh, what are you seeing? And you've, you kind of explain what it's been like in the past as far as how psychiatry has basically worked. But in the future, moving forward, we're obviously going to see changes. Do you agree with that? And if so, what makes you believe that? Well, we're going to see changes because, as I said, this, this whole new way of treating people um, appropriately up front and getting them better and them not becoming lifelong treatment um, resistant patients is a whole new way of doing things. And of course, this makes great economic sense as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is nothing more expensive than an untreated psychiatric patient. They mm -hmm. don't work. Mm -hmm. They end up going to prison. Social services remove their children. They have new livers. They contract physical illnesses. They're very, very expensive, an untreated psychiatric patient. So the idea of bringing someone in, giving them an intensive and admittedly rather expensive upfront treatment, it does make sense if it gets them better and they become functional people again. Right. So although it seems an expensive upfront thing, in the long term, it's going to work and it's going to be cheaper. And I'm quite certain that public health systems like the NHS in the UK um, or insurance companies, which are more of an issue in the States, will take up these treatments because not only are they the right moral and ethical and clinical thing to do, but they're actually the cheaper thing to do because they work. Psychiatry has got itself stuck in this rut of being very expensive, but also not particularly effective. 
-hmm. So if we can get treatments that work and get people better, um, it's better all round for public health. So I do see that these um, treatments will become mainstream because they're the right thing to do. Patients like them, patients want them, and it makes economic sense. Okay, so you've just explained on how psychiatry has been performed in the past. So moving forward, we're obviously going to see change. I've talked about quality versus quantity because, you know, let's face it, um, and what I mean by that is a lot of people are obviously going to therapy, but they're going, as you said, a number of times. Whereas, yes, if they go for one session, it's going to be probably more money for that session, but you're looking at going once, twice, maybe three times versus, say, 20 or 30 times or like ongoing for a number of years with psychiatry. So I understand that. So my question is, based on where we're at today when it comes to the current state globally of mental health, where are we today? Yes, we're going to see changes, but maybe elaborate a little bit on what makes you believe that for people to understand more. Yeah, so as, as, as I've said, we've painted ourselves into this corner of maintenance daily treatments using drugs that paper over the cracks but don't actually get to the heart right. of the matter. The heart of the matter in most long-term chronic mental disorders is trauma, and that's addressed through psychotherapy, not through drugs. And so um, psychedelic psychotherapy is a form of specialized psychotherapy that uses the drugs to enhance the psychotherapy, and this allows you to go deeper into the relationship and the dynamics um, and allows a patient to get past that stuckness and rigidity that maintains mental disorder. So as you quite rightly say, with just a few sessions of psychotherapy as um, assisted by drugs like MDMA or psilocybin or ketamine, um, we can help a person to overcome these long-term rigid narratives mm -hmm. that have them stuck in these mental health ruts. And, and that allows for effective treatments that in many cases are life changing and transformative. Right. Now, of course, you know, these drugs are not a panacea. They're not a magic wand. Um, psychiatry is complicated. It's not just about psychological issues. It's physical issues. It's lifestyle. It's social issues. It's where you live. It's your job. It's your work. It's your family. It's your childhood. All of these things are very important to tackle in order to gain good mental functioning because mental health is not a button that you switch no. either on or off no mental well-being is a lifelong process um and psychedelics do appear in many cases to be they provide this spontaneous jump in lifestyle change and i think that's what's really exciting about the current development it's a shift in the way you think differently am i understanding that correctly yeah um you know most mental disorders are about being stuck in this rut and these usually um, uh, arise very early in life um, through child maltreatment and abuse. You know, I am useless. I am a failure. I am unloved. The world is dangerous. People cannot be trusted. We learn these narratives when we're tiny as a result of our experiences as children um, with child maltreatment and abuse. And then they stay throughout life and they, they power and maintain these mental disorders as an adult. And most traditional treatments don't really get to the heart of that. Psychedelics allow the patient to go there and address these repressed emotional issues. So the way, and so the, the way the brain, I guess, is really formed at such a young age, even if things happen, even as recent as you're an adult a year, two years ago, you're going to handle certain things in a certain way and that only compounds to more stress on the mental health or brain in this case. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, in some ways, it's I often when I talk to patients, I talk about how they're using their lazy infantile brain right. because it's just become habitual. Yeah. So when they were, you know, three or four years old and they were being abused and assaulted, um, they developed this idea that the world is dangerous and unsafe and everyone's out to get them. And then many, many years later, they're 30 years old, right. they're standing in a queue at the post office. And their infantile brain kicks in. It's because I'm useless. It's because I'm a failure. It's because I'm a bad person. And and this is this is underpinning their depression, their anxiety. It's not. It's completely benign. It's a cue at the post office. But this is right. where this lazy brain, these old pathways have become this habitual way of thinking. And it's very hard to treat those parts once they've once they've embedded. Um, but psychedelics are the best, newest form of innovative technology we have. 
that kind of blows out the cobwebs, defrags the brain, reboots the brain, gives you this opportunity to see life in a different way. It opens yeah. that window <clears throat> of opportunity and we can see that pharmacologically um, and in terms of neurophysiology about brain changes. But then if you hit them with psychotherapy at that point, while their brain is primed, um, you can create new narratives, new pathways, right. new versions of self. And this really is innovative. And it's like nothing else we've had in psychiatry for the last hundred years. You were featured in this chapter, MDMA, and it's rumored to be the first compound that will be legalized. And rumor has it, it could be within the next 12 months. So if I'm a viewer and I'm seeing this, it looks very promising within this actual film. Explain to my audience why this compound in particular will be the first to be legalized and why I guess it's moving at a quicker pace than others. So, um, you know, developing a, a molecule into a medicine is a complex and expensive and time consuming business. And indeed, psychedelic drugs are no different than um, paracetamol, ibuprofen or um, penicillin. As far as the drug agencies are concerned, you have to jump through a bunch of hoops. You have to do what are called phase one studies, phase two studies, phase three studies. And these are on increasing numbers of patients, developing protocols, demonstrating safety, demonstrating efficiency and efficacy. And so um, MDMA has had to go through all of those hoops. Right. And it's just um, it's just simply a bit further along the line. Um, uh, the work of uh, MAPS um, that were featured with Rick Doblin in the documentary. Yeah. Um, they've been doing this for 35 plus yeah. years and they are now in the phase three development. Um, which means they're about to get it over the line and get it licensed in America under FDA and then in Europe under EMA. And that is indeed, um, we're looking at end of 2023, beginning of 2024, we hope. Psilocybin is a couple of years behind that. They're just going into the phase three studies now. So um, it's it's not about the government. People sometimes say, you know, do the government, does the government block this research because it's controversial? Right. The government doesn't block the research because it's controversial. They have the psychedelic drugs and developing them as medicines. It just has to jump through the same hoops as any other medicine. And it takes time and it takes money. Makes sense. And that's why it's taken so long. 1985 is when this was scheduled as a Schedule One narcotic, MDMA. And Rick Doblin in the film said shortly after that, we uh, have to go in with an FDA approach. Uh, we're now... 37 years later and slow and steady wins the race. He was actually featured in Joe Rogan's uh, podcast and Joe really commends obviously his approach on how they're doing the research as an industry, as a whole. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit off camera and, and finding out what's right and what needs to change with the growth of this industry. Um, what do you think we are doing right? Obviously, the research and data that's being produced is obviously in a, a step in the right direction. But are there things that we need to change or pivot in any way to kind of like piggyback off of that mindset as to what Rick Doblin's talking about as as far as going in with a more FDA approach to really legitimize this industry as a whole? Yeah, I mean, what we need to do is we need to get home with the data. That's that's really the, the end of the day. You know, um, Although these drugs have a fascinating and interesting cultural history, both in terms of their indigenous use and their non and their recreational non clinical uses. And I love all that aspect of psychedelic culture that in itself is not particularly helpful at getting these drugs over the line when it comes to contemporary approval agencies. The way to do it is through science careful, conservative, sober science, which is pretty boring at times, it's got to be said. Um, so this is what makes these working with these compounds so interesting. They do have this beautiful, rich, colorful history in our culture, but that doesn't mean a thing to the regulatory authorities. Of course. All they want to know is, do they work as medicines? Are they safe? Are they efficacious? Will they benefit patients? And so what we need to do to make this work is to work with authorities on their grounds and that means getting this data in and and i know that you know we were talking earlier about this there is quite a lot of conflict from some elements of the psychedelic community we have people who are underground therapists or ceremonial therapists who are objectionable to the concept of medicalization or what they might call corporatization i'm not i believe that medicalization equals accessibility um, you know, we've had psychedelic drugs in popular culture for 75 years, but still 
Most people cannot and don't want to access them because they're illegal. So we need a framework of legitimacy um, in order to get these drugs approved. Because I am on the side of my patients more so than, my, than I am on the side of recreational use. I want to see my patients accessing these. And this means um, patients, most patients are not hippies. Most patients do not want to break the law. Most patients do not want to go to raves and festivals to get their drugs. They want to go into their white-coated doc doctor's office and get them prescribed because they're approved legal medicines. So, um, you know, don't get me wrong. I love the psychedelic culture and I have a big, big part of it, as you can see from the Netflix film um, and my, my initial roots in it. But my primary concern is getting these onto the statute books for my patients. So what we have to do is we need to work with authorities, not against authorities in order to achieve this. Yeah, well, something to think about, too. You were 18, as you said in the film, during that time. So I'm 45, and I know myself today versus 18 is a little bit different. It's a special time in obviously somebody's heart, but I'm going to look at obviously MDMA a little bit different today if I'm battling, you know, some sort of mental health, depression, uh, can it be because, you know, I think a lot of the times it can be very overwhelming for an adult, but at, especially at this age, when you're trying to obviously support a family, get ahead in life with your careers, you have all these decisions to make. It's a lot of pressure. And, you know, I, I think you, you bang on with a lot of this stuff right now. It's not supposed to be obviously promoted from a recreational standpoint, but the benefits of what the data is going to prove how it improves the quality of people's life, and most importantly, just educating people on the overall process of it all. Because I think there's still a lot of people that are very optimistic and interested in the space, but yet still very nervous on how it can work and can they be effective in a negative way. But I guess that's where the mind is kind of wired in a certain way where we're thinking about impending doom versus actually the upside of what could be uh, in a lot of these cases. Uh, do you agree with that? No, absolutely. I mean, MDMA is quite remarkable as a compound. I've often said in my talks, if you were going to invent a drug to treat trauma-focused psychotherapy, you would come up with MDMA. Mm. It ticks all the right boxes in terms of reduction of the fear center, providing this positive, strongly positively felt mood, improving empathy, improving the relationship between the patient and the therapist. And what this allows the patient to do is to go to an address difficult, forbidden, avoidant memories that they normally wouldn't go to. Because, you know, when, you, when you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, um, you have become an absolute expert at not talking about that night when you were 10 years old yeah. and that thing happened to you. You've, you will drink, you will use opiates, you will self-harm, you'll do whatever you can to not talk about that night. And then you go into your traditional therapy and the psychotherapist says, well, let's talk about that night. And you're out the door. You flee. You drop out. Of so let me and ask you a question. Combat. What about the people that do or can talk about it, but are still not finding an answer or solution? Does it still help in that case as well? Yeah. So those are the people for whom MDMA works. It turns off this amygdala effect. It dampens this fear response. And as I said in the Netflix movie, um, through my own experiences and, and those of my friends, it allows you to go there and talk about these things. And that really is the holy grail of trauma-focused psychotherapy, a compound that allows you to go into forbidden memories, not be overwhelmed by the negative fears that normally come with recall of those memories, but allows you to do the psychotherapy for the first time in your life. And it's quite remarkable watching patients on MDMA. I bet. When you, I, say to the, I say to them, you know, let, can we talk about that thing that happened? And they say with the tears streaming down their face, yes, I can. I can't believe it. My whole life, I've never been able to talk about it. But today I can because you've they've got, I think of MDMA as this bulletproof vest or sort of life jacket to wear, a life preserver, which allows them to go into battle with their trauma in a way which they normally can't do with traditional psychotherapy. So it provides this cushion of support. Um, now, of course, it's all about the skill of the psychotherapeutic relationship. Yeah. It's all about the trusting and the empathy between the patient and the therapist. And that's essential to get right. But when you get that right, it can move people from treatment resistance into treatment efficacy. And that's a very valuable. Thing. What is the most common personality trait that you see when somebody comes in for the first time? I would think nervousness, fear, 
um, a lot of the stuff that probably goes through their mind as to why they're there in the first place. Um, is, is that normal? Yeah. I mean, we, we, we can start getting onto the topic of categorical diagnoses in psychiatry. Um, I think one of the things that psychedelics are doing is they're blowing open the concept of categorical diagnoses, you know, depression, anxiety, PTSD, personality disorders, addictions. In my opinion, underpinning all of these is trauma. Um, either what we would call big T trauma, things like physical or sexual abuse, the stuff that goes to social services, or what I would call small T trauma, emotional abuse, neglect. We must not take our eye off the ball with those childhood experiences. You know, being told, I don't love you, your dad doesn't love you, we didn't want a boy, we wanted a girl, you're stupid, you're fat, no one's going to like you. This, you know, no one's being physically or sexually abused here. But that kind of phys that sort of emotional abuse yes. is tremendously damaging to the human psyche. And so whatever the diagnosis, whether it's PTSD, addictions, eating disorders, depression, anxiety, underpinning so many of these long lifelong mental disorders is are these unresolved childhood trauma issues. And what MDMA does so well is it allows you to go there and reboot the brain and rebrand yourself and provide a sense of empathy not just for others but also for the self i'm a good person i can achieve all those views and labels and narratives i carried around in my head all these years they don't have to be like that i can do well and what's important is you don't have to stay high once you've done the work in psychotherapy on mdma it lasts you've made those changes so I think this is why it's so effective when combined with good psychotherapy. Well, that, that's the thing I think people are learning more is the impact of, okay, if you take this recreational and you go to a rave, it's like you're not really sitting down with a psychedelic assisted therapist <clears throat> where you have to obviously target specific categories or specific topics, which is why you're there in the first place. Another important question, because I had somebody on last week, when you look at these medications, it's not addictive. You go a couple of times, but... Are there any consequences like related health wise to the heart or anything with taking these medications that there needs to be any concern about? Or is that still early stages of research that we're trying to figure out? Uh, no, it's not early stages of research at all. We we have very, very good scientific knowledge about the toxicity or rather lack of toxicity and high degree of safety of the psychedelic drugs. So classic psychedelic, psychedelic drugs like LSD and psilocybin they do virtually nothing to the body. They're virtually inert physiologically. Wow. They, they dilate the pupils, that's it. So um, they are incredibly safe. Now MDMA does have a little bit of a more of an effect on the body. It certainly does raise your heart rate, your blood pressure and your temperature transiently for a few hours, and then they come back down to normal. Now, of course, there, with MDMA, we do see some fatalities. It's not 100% safe. Um, and there are some very rare um, uh, reactions to MDMA in a small number of people um, in which they can become very hypothermic, very high temperature, um, or they can um, have very low sodium in their blood, and that's called hyponatremia, neutremia, and that is what leads to fatalities. But the, a point, an important point about this is that's when it's being used recreationally in a non-controlled medical right, setting. Right, right. Um, in, like, in the form of ecstasy. Um, all of these factors can be well controlled in a clinical setting. But even, even with ecstasy use, which is widespread, in the UK we have 750,000 doses of ecstasy taken every weekend, every weekend, three quarters of a million doses of ecstasy for the last 30 years. That yet the number of fatalities is staggeringly small less than five a year once you take out other concomitant drug okay. use such as alcohol okay. or opiates. So they are very, very <clears throat> safe, and especially in the clinical setting. It's the quality of house music in London. It's the best house music in the world, is it not? I'm not a big house music fan, you know, but um, uh, I... Uh, I think it's the best music in the world. I think actually the best music in the world comes from Bristol in the UK. Bristol, I want last question. Data obviously speaks for itself, so if you, as you said. Uh, your one clinic location in Bristol, which is uh, featured in the film, you showcased your MDMA room for therapy. 
uh, which really looked impressive. So I know the movie or the documentary is only a couple of weeks old, but have you seen any response or inquiries from uh, people since uh, the film was released? Yes. Yeah, so um, at Awaken Life Sciences, we now have three clinics. We have Bristol, London and Oslo, and we're opening a whole bunch of new ones. We're aiming for 10 to 15 clinics in the next few years. We want to be the high street presence for psychotherapy with psychedelics. Now, at the moment, um, ketamine is the only licensed right. psychedelic, so it's <clears> the only <throat> one we can use. But we're very keen to brand ourselves not as a ketamine clinic, of which there are hundreds in the States, most of which don't use psychotherapy. They just use it as an antidepressant. We are branding ourselves as a psychedelic medical center. Ketamine now, MDMA and psilocybin coming soon. So, um, yeah, going to your question, have we had a lot of interest? The um, phone has not stopped. Wow. We've got inquiries through the roof. Now, admittedly, a lot of people asking for MDMA. And that's really difficult because we just can't do it. MDMA is not available in, as a treatment. It's only available in a research protocol. Right. We hope to use MDMA out of awakened clinics as soon as we practically can. So as soon as we get licenses to do so, we'll be adding MDMA and then later psilocybin or whatever other psychedelic drugs get approved. But for the time being, it's ketamine assisted psychedelic psychotherapy. We are researching MDMA. We're, car we're carrying forward our work with alcohol use disorder in a randomized control right. study um, <laughs> alongside other R&D products at Awaken. But yeah, as soon as we can use MDMA, we will. Co-founder of Awaken Life Sciences, trades on the NEO Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol AWKN, Dr. Ben Sessa, who was featured in the new Netflix, Netflix do documentary called How to Change Your Mind. Fascinating film that people uh, should definitely, definitely see. Uh, listen, I appreciate your time. This has been very informative. Let's please keep in touch. Sure thing, Shad. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for the exposure and good luck with the rest of the Yeah, program. you as well. Thanks, Dr. Sessa. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, wait until you see what we have next. Some of the best thought leaders in the verticals that we cover, from cannabis and psychedelics to cryptos and NFTs and sports wagering. So if you want to learn more, make sure to click on that bell for all notifications. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.